Guma Malgan Gumba Nani Gyan Indu, which is good evening. It is good to see you here in Baragam, the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Vicky McDonald, State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. Welcome to tonight's event, the third talk in our series presented proudly in partnership with The Conversation, the world's leading free fact-based news source written by academics and edited by journalists. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. State Library is a place for all people, from all backgrounds and of all ages. Stories are at the heart of what we do. Like me, I am sure you can remember the books and stories from your childhood that helped shape your understanding of the world. And it is through stories, knowledge and creativity that State Library inspires possibilities in even our littlest Queenslanders. Whether it is an art-based play or early literacy activities, our programs for children and families encourage young people to use their imaginations and find meaning in their surroundings. State Library's Big Voices exhibition showcases the way children tell their stories and share their experiences through art. In a mix of charming and poignant works, Big Voices demonstrates the pure, powerful and unfiltered lens of the child. You can experience the exhibition yourself online or on Level 4 here at State Library. Big Voices reflects on children's perspectives and tonight we examine what it means for adults to meaningfully connect with children's stories and concerns. I am pleased now to introduce Dr Barbara Piscatelli AM, our facilitator for tonight's panel discussion. Enjoy the conversation. Good evening. Children and young people have been engaged in potent storytelling and subtle social change for centuries. Think Anne Frank, or more recently, Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, and Zach Dumaji. Yet too often, adults minimize children's voices by saying they are too young to have a useful perspective, or they should just stick to being kids. I think this is a form of unconscious bias against children. And it's a kind of ageism that we don't really often discuss. But tonight, we plan to change that situation. Tonight, we are focusing on our, our conversation on the notion that children can change the world, that children are active agents for social change, and that they have great ideas. There's been a global movement for children since the late 19th century when advocates championed the uh, right for children to stop being in labor. Ever since, there's been persistent work to improve the rights of children and to raise their status in society. In 1989, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was signed and thereby ensured that children were given protections from exploitation, abuse, and violence and guaranteed the right to fully participate in society and in decisions being made on their behalf. Today, there is a growing body of information by, for, and about children, about their place in society, their material culture, and their stories. In the 21st century, there's been a lot of attention given to children's voice. Children are seen now as making a unique contribution toward understanding the social world. Um, and they, there is significant academic research provided, which gives us new insights based on children's perspectives as social actors. These studies have avoided the trap of uncritical clumping or generalizations about children's voices and provide for us then deep insights into the multivocality of, child, of childhood and offer us the chance to understand the specific nuances and the distinctive meanings of children's lives. Tonight in our conversation, we're going to explore the idea of children as social actors and as writers and artists. We are going to look at the big picture and the small details of the lives of children and I'm delighted to introduce our conversationalists to talk about how children can change the world. 
So firstly, Associate Professor S uh, Sandra Phillips is a member of the Waka Waka and Gurungurung Nations in what is now known as Queensland. Sandra is an Associate Dean of Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. Her research interest lies in Indigenous creativity and storytelling. She has published in diverse outlets. She is also a member of the Library Board of Queensland, the, uh, the NIDA Board, National Institute of Dramatic Art, and a member of IATSIS, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Institute in Canberra. I'd like to also introduce Kate Douglas. Kate is professor in the College of Humanities, Arts and Sciences at Flinders University. Her primary research interest is how children read and interpret true stories and how children share aspects of their own life stories every day. And Gay Lindsay is a lecturer in the early years degree at the University of Wollongong. Before entering academia, Gay worked for more than 20 years as a preschool teacher, director, and early childhood consultant. Gay has just co-hosted an international online conference for the arts in early childhood attended by nearly 1,000 participants. For the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to talk about three big questions. We hope you enjoy the conversation, and we welcome your comments and questions via Facebook and the SLQ live stream chat box. So the first question, what's happening to make children seen and heard in society? So Sandra Phillips. Your biography on the State Library of Queensland website says, as a child, my local library in country Queensland provided a window to a world I could not yet see beyond the pages of books. Books and other cultural forms allow us to see versions of ourselves at the same time as helping us imagine beyond ourselves. These are things that make libraries special to me and I hope to others. But I've just been reading Tara June Winch's wonderful book, The Yield. And she identifies in there that there are some really powerful things about books, and then there are limitations. So she says of her main character, August, she says, the book was second to food when August was little. Then the book took the lead. For August, the library was her most important source of books. She talks about the mobile library that came to her town and the book choices that she had there, offering something for everyone, but also very limited. And poignantly, she says, in every mobile library book, she could never find herself or her sister. Never a girl like August or Jetta Gondawindi, not ever. So you've explored this notion for a very long time, for more than 20 years. This this notion of the absence of identities in, in books, particularly for children and young people. So I'd love it if you could just explore that notion with us for some time. Thanks so much, Barbara, and lovely to see you, Gay and Kate, um, this evening, and to be here with all of those people online as well. Um, before I speak, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I sit and we gather tonight. Um, and in doing so, also acknowledge the lands of um, the lands on which our audience members are also located. Um, a couple of things first, Barbara. The 2016 Australian Bureau of Statistics Census recorded that more than half of us, more than half of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, at that time were under the age of 25. And our average age at that time was 20.3, as compared with the non-Indigenous um, mainstream society having an average age of 37.8. So I, I probably won't return to too many more statistics tonight, but I think that helps reveal the young nature of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Australia as an, you know, a relatively useful aggregated statistic. Um, if you were to look at the population pyramid from that same census, uh, the Indigenous um, bars go out quite wide um, in the younger age group and 
um, is the exact reverse mm -hmm. as we um, move through our um, life cycle. So um, we have a very young population, which um, is, you know, a fantastic and also a challenge because we need to make sure that we, um, you know, keep our young people healthy and thriving mm. and help them um, lead um, full and healthy lives and build full, um, full and healthy futures. So, um, so I just wanted to make that point first. Secondly, I've not so much dealt with the absence of um, indigeneity in texts, in books, and in other creative forms so much as worked my butt off um, in making sure there was a presence mm. in our literature. So um, I worked uh, earlier in my life with Magabala Books, which is an Indigenous publishing house based in Broome, Western Australia in the Kimberley. Um, Magabala, I understand, considers itself one of the most remote publishers in the world. And Barbara, you would know that mm. their early publishing, uh, their early trade list um, featured some really strong titles for children that were highly awarded mm. and rewarded. Um, Jarani Rufftail um, was the winner of the 1993 Children's Book Council of Australia Book of the Year Award. It took out all of these other awards as well. Um, the Western Australian Premier's Book Awards for children's and young adult um, books and a whole host of other premiers literary awards in um, the early 1990s, which was just before I moved to Broome to work with Magabala Books. So um, when Magabala, um, which for those who don't know, it's spelt very much like one is hearing it, M-A-G-A-B-A-L-A, -A -A, if you do want to have a little internet search on Magabala Books and you're not aware of them. Um, their list is phenomenal. Uh, their early, their very first publication, which you can't actually find on their website, was a tiny little book called Maiyi, M-A-Y-I, um, and it was about um, the plant uh, that Magabala is um, based on, the a bush banana. And it's fascinating now in 2021 to consider mm -hmm. in 19, the, the mid-late 1980s that a group of First Nations people in the Kimberley were going, we need to record our cultural knowledge, our cultural heritage, and let's do that in book form. So Mai, that tiny little book, was the first book published by Magabala Books and its parent company, uh, Kalak, which is the Kimberley Aboriginal um, Language and Culture Association. So Magabala Books that is how I began my publishing career and for that I'll be forever grateful because through that we, we had to grapple with issues of representation in a form that was introduced through colonisation, through invasion and colonisation. So there were lots of um, things to learn on the way in translating oral history into text, into print, into translating sometimes, you know, major creation stories or origin stories into forms that could meet a wider market. And um, it's at this point, perhaps I'll, I'll mention something that I haven't particularly explored, but um, a friend and colleague of mine, Christine Black, um, Dr. Christine Black wondered aloud with me quite recently, mm, I'm a little concerned about the, the use of origin story for children's matter. Mm. So I think there's something in that. I think, um, I think Australian book trade has really benefited from some beautiful illustrated children's books um, that have come from Indigenous cultures and storytellers and writers and illustrators. Um, and they've formed a kind of bridge um, between the cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I think we probably do need to spend a bit more time interrogating that translation and how effective it is. Does it minimise the um, enormity of the origin stories? Or is it actually 
going, you know, the next generation are the inheritors of these stories. Um, thus, they can, they can gain access at a very young age, which goes to these larger questions of the agency of children and adults' recognition of that agency. And anyway, moving through, though, I also worked with the University of Queensland Press um, and then later managed Aboriginal Studies Press. All of those three publishing houses have um, incredible children's lists uh, and other publishers who were the independent, Indigenous-led uh, publishers or Australian independent publishers with significant Indigenous relationship, um, like the University of Queensland Press, like Fremantle Press, brought forward um, Indigenous storytelling and writing uh, in the first kind of big critical mass wave of the 1980s. So fast forward to 2021, and we've seen a whole lot of um, opportunity flourish in the literary sector, which I think we may touch on later, or are you happy if I refer to things now? Carry on. So um, the 1980s, as I said, Mugabella Books, IAD Press, which is um, based in Alice Springs, Aboriginal Studies Press, which is based in Canberra, University of Queensland Press here in St. Lucia, Brisbane, of course, Fremantle Press out of WA, um, were the, the independent publishers who really um, made an impact on Australian trade um, offerings that prioritise Indigenous stories and prioritise Indigenous um, values, I guess, too. Like you, you refer to Tara Jean Winch's latest novel, The Yield, <coughs> which of course has taken out in 2020 the Australian um, Prime Minister's Literary Award, um, the three categories from memory of the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award, um, highly critically acclaimed, and that Tara June Winch's work is, uh, is, you know, the kind of symbol of the evolution of the maturity of Australian publishing and Australian storytelling that that early work in the 1980s and 1990s has now influenced critical reception, um, has now influenced what everyday Australian readers are expecting to see or a little more familiar with to the extent that we have Indigenous writers taking out pretty much all of the major mm. uh, critical awards in Australia. Melissa Lukashenko, Tony Birch, Tara June Winch, Alexis Wright. <coughs> so I just wanted to kind of contextualise some of that. And I think um, writing and publishing for children has been a big part of that early work. And it's also continued through the decades right. to the current point. So the current point, this is fascinating. Just in ma this month, Magabala Books is um, releasing... A, a book for children by Sally Morgan, mm -hmm. yeah? So Sally Morgan's first book, of course, was My Place, published in 1987 by Fremantle Arts Centre Press, as it was then known. Um, once again, fast forward 2021, Sally Morgan's bringing out a children's book with Mugabala books. Um, and at the same time, her daughter, Amberlyn Malina, is being published by Fremantle Press um, with her amazing storytelling in illustrated children's format. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing these kind of cross-generational right. um, flow-on effects um, in the literary sector in Australia. Um, and of course, we're here at the State Library of Queensland this year celebrating the 10th anniversary of Black and Right, which was just this amazing opportunity for Indigenous writers, storytellers, and editors, um, and one of the works, or two of the works through that, every year, um, uh, people can send in their man unpublished manuscripts and be considered for a writing fellowship, which, um, along with the cash prize uh, and the, the wonderful status and recognition of the merit of the work, is a publishing opportunity that the library auspices with Hachette um, the commercial publisher. 
um, one of two of the works in that uh, corpus that's come through black and white are Bakir and B, um, which is a Torres Strait Islander creation story, written by Gillian Boyd and then illustrated um, by her niece, who at the time was 18 years of age, and also um, Deadly D and Justice Jones, Making the Teen, uh, um, co-authored with Scotty Prince, Scott yeah. Prince, the former Brisbane Bronco. Bronco. Now, um, Deadly D and Just Justice Jones won the 2014 Speech Pathology Australia Book of the Year Award in the Indigenous Children's category, and others of the books that have come through Black and White have also been critically successful. Um, I mention these because this is, this is quite a new innovation, like to see a state library auspice a writing, editing and publishing mm. initiative um, as, as they, we have done here in the library is um, still unique. It is challenging because it's not necessarily, uh, making books is not necessarily what a library typically does, um, but the opportunity that Sue Abbey, one of the, uh, the founder of Black and Right, um, how she designed this, it was, um, you know, it's never lost its appeal to all of the people who are connected with Black and Right. Um, so I mentioned Black and Right because it's different. Mm -hmm. It's not a publisher, but it is ensuring the publication of some fantastic Indigenous literature. And that is a huge shift in 40 years mm -hmm. to see the transition from absence of information to locally generated um, publishing and now to winning literary prizes. It's quite a phenomenal trajectory. So I just, I'm going to turn now to Kate Douglas. Kate, your work focuses on how children portray their lives in biography and autobiography, and it acknowledges the cultural contribution that children have made through their diaries, memoirs, blogs, and their art. Um, you explore the notions of agency and participation in childhood in stories told by children in their own voices. Um, these personal stories help children shine their light onto the world. Arguably, there's uh, no child of the past couple of years more recognizable for their work than the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. Um, media narratives of her portray her variously, like, mm, and it's not always positive. She's considered strange, hypocritical, angry, non-compliant, but also fiercely intelligent and, in my opinion, heroic. Um, I'd like you to talk both about your work and about the position that Greta um, portrays in society and why you think that is. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'm really you know, enjoying this discussion so much already and um, looking forward to seeing how it goes. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians uh, of the land on which I speak today, uh, who are the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. Um, so when I started, I've only, it's funny because I've only ever worked um, in nonfiction studies since my career started. I've only ever worked um, in the area of children. I've only ever looked at adults writing about their childhoods or children writing about their childhoods. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's been a natural kind of progression because there's certainly lots and lots of texts um, being published or have, having been published, um, particularly in the sort of late 90s, um, early 2000s, where people talked about their childhoods, usually people um, in their 50s um, or beyond, mm -hmm. um, talking about how they had a very difficult childhood and in some ways rewriting um, the history of childhood um, and correcting some of the mythology um, around childhoods being, you know, wonderful and pleasant, um, just not pleasant now, you know, but well, they were pleasant in the past. And I think correcting some of those um, kind of, you know, misconceptions is really important um, to those memoirists of the late 90s um, and early 2000s. And I think the natural kind of evolution for me um, in my research was um, well, I've heard about a lot about children from adults. I want to hear more about children from children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think children are producing, as you said in your little introduction, um, children are producing um, what I call life narrative text. So writing mm -hmm. stories about their lives or the lives of others, often family members, 
Um, they're doing this kind of stuff every day from a very young age. It becomes part of education um, and it becomes something people kind of, you know, evolves into kind of creative pursuits as they get older. Um, but the other, I think, aspect of this that I'm really interested in is I don't think that when we think about inclusion, I say we, I don't mean, you know, clever and enlightened people, you know, in, on this panel and um, listening, I think, as a society, um, we don't always think about inclusion um, as excluding children. And I think that it's really important to start thinking about inclusion um, in relation to how we might better include children in all aspects of cultural life. Um, so I'm interested in the ways that children tell stories and the kind of um, literatures, genres and technologies they use to kind of tell those stories. Um, but I'm also interested in how they interpret stories written for them. So I'm doing lots of readership studies at the moment which tap mm -hmm. into um, what children really think about non-fictional stories. I mean, non-fictional stories written for children profess to be telling stories about um, childhood and children that should be interesting to them. Um, and I want to find out a little bit more about how they perceive those stories. So I'm doing that. So the notion of children as critics is kind of um, my latest interest um, and it's something I'm really excited about. So lots of readership studies and I'm less interested. In fact, I'm not at all interested in childhood literacy. That's not my area of kind of expertise uh -huh. or interest. Um, I'm interested in interpretation. I'm interested in how they, they kind of um, make meaning um, of true stories that circulate um, about them or about the children's lives and, and what kind of contribution children might make to criticism as critics. So, you know, I might be doing myself out of a job here um, as an academic, but, you know, I'm interested in doing that um, at this point in my career, it's fine. Um, so Greta, I think, um, you know, I became interested in, in Greta inevitably because I think that um, she's one of those people who now has um, almost like a mini archive of life narrative texts around her. You know, she started by telling her own story, you know, on the, on the streets of, and, and on parliament steps of, in, in Sweden um, and slowly um, through her, her public speeches, which I think gained um, so much attention um, and rightly so. Then we had the wonderful documentary, um, I Am Greta, um, and now we've got little books being produced about her. There's the, one of the little people, Big Lives, um, stories is being produced about Greta. So she's a subject now. She's become a subject both um, for biographical representation and also in representing her own life. Um, I think why people don't like her, if people don't like her, it's because she's smart and articulate and this is somehow unexpected. And I think that's wow. the problem, right? The problem wow. is that it's unexpected. I mean, why is it unexpected that a child, um, a 15 year old adolescent um, would have strong opinions and would be articulate? Um, I think that she doesn't hold back. So I guess that perception that she is blunt um, and people, you know, draw that back to her ASD, which she refers to as a superpower, uh -huh. which I also love because, again, it's so transgressive in terms of um, ruffling people's expectations uh, of what she should be doing and saying and, and if she should be holding back or curtailing her words. I mean, the, how, the standing there and saying, how dare you to the world uh -huh. leaders? I mean, you know, who, who, who does that? You know, Greta does it. And it's brilliant, right? We all just kind of think, wow, you know, imagine having that level of, of, of courage, um, self-confidence, but also knowledge, you know? And this is the other thing I think that, that um, people are surprised about her knowledge, right? And one of the criticisms of her, and it comes from, you know, world leaders often, not the ones with much credibility, but, um, you know, the idea that she, she can't possibly know those things. And, and in the documentary, um, I Am Greta, there's a really interesting um, section where her father talks about how much time she spends reading and researching, uh -huh. informing herself, right? Um, and I can't, again, I can't understand why this isn't believable. It doesn't fit stereotypes of, of what people might imagine 15 year old girls are doing because they're you know, too busy deriding 15 year old girls for not doing those things. And yet they're derided when they do those things uh -huh. as well, right? Uh -huh. So. You know, you, you're kind of a bit damned if you do and damned if you don't, if you're a 15-year-old girl. And obviously that she's a girl. I mean, if she were a boy, uh -huh. um, would this be different? Would people perceive her differently? Yep, <laughs> I think that's probably the easy answer. Um, we don't really accept children as cultural critics. So that, again, mm -hmm. the idea of even if you are intelligent and articulate, um, perhaps, you know, cultural criticism isn't a space for you as a child um, or an adolescent. And I think that's something we should be interrogating a lot more because why you know children have 
um, perspectives that adults don't have. And it's as simple mm. as that. It's as simple as imagining that if you want to fill a room full of intelligent people with diverse perspectives, why would we not include children? You know, they see things um, that we can't see, right? And it's right. as simple as that. Um, we don't, yeah, I, I made that point. We don't expect them to be well-read and informed. And it's fascinating because, again, this can become an easy point of criticism despite the fact that certain um, nations, um, powerful nations in our world, accept underqualified leaders, you know, and yeah. we're, we're criticizing Greta for being underqualified. Um, and that's, again, a kind of a crazy notion because children have always been very informed. There's always oh, yeah. been articulate, you know, um, precocious, clever children who know all the things that they shouldn't know. We perceive that they shouldn't know and that they've always been around. We just haven't noticed. Um, I think that she is a really crucial figure. Um, I'm mean, putting the positives on it. She's a really um, crucial figure in helping people understand children's and adolescents' potential as activists. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what's been really good is she has opened the door. And, and again, I think the doors have opened for uh, a diversity of, of adolescents to come forward and speak about particularly environmental issues, but lots of other issues too. Um, and I think that's been fantastic. So for whatever, um, the many grounds that people choose to criticize her on, I think that how well she has encouraged a culture of inclusion um, around young people being able to speak publicly um, is a humongous legacy, right? It's something that mm. she should be incredibly proud of. Um, and I think the film, I Am Greta, if you haven't seen it, it's really um, wonderful because it does provide that intimate perspective on her that I think, I don't think anybody could come away from that film not having a, a much greater sense of why she is um, mm. a spectacular human being, you know, with um, a level of kind of intellectual superpower, which she kind of jokes about, but it's very clear to see yeah. that she has, right? Um, and, you know, mm. why why would we not celebrate that person? Um, and why would we not elevate her um, to the status that she has? Um, she is visible um, and she's turned, you know, lots of visibility back onto um, adult politicians. And I think that's been, again, something that people didn't expect her to do. Um, and she's done it. And, um, and I think she is, you know, an absolute super force in, um, in the world right now. That's, right. that's my little, um, that's my little, you know, almost rant about why Greta is so wonderful. It's, it's interesting. Her wonderfulness has a lot to do with the support system that she has around her too. Like, uh, she is always crediting and acknowledging the support of her family. And they also have provided her with protection. So this leads me to question two, which I'm going to focus on children's voices. What is the role of the adult in making children's ideas seen and heard? So there's a big power differential between children and adults. And Consequently, it's often hard to hear a child's voice outside of the school and the family. In the public arena, Greta has taken a really prominent position, same as Malala uh, did um, earlier. Um, so when children get the platform to speak, they need a strong support system around them. I discovered this myself in my own practice. So when I first started collecting children's art, and saw it as a powerful tool for portraying their ideas to the community, I realized that I was really like a handmaiden, in some sense, to children's ideas. I started collecting their ideas about 35 years ago, and I used art as the vehicle for portraying their ideas. I didn't work alone. I worked with large teams of people, artists, teachers, elders, um, student teachers, and we went into classrooms and we would ask children certain questions. I was very curious about what children thought about things. Um, for example, what do they think about play, about their human rights, about the environment, about their family, about themselves, about where they live, their community. So in very s structured ways, using the open-ended vehicle of art, I went out to find children's ideas. And I was prompted to do this when I was um, working on a committee to put, an ex to put children's participation in a children's rights uh, conference. And people wanted to put children on stage. And I thought, 
you can't do that. They're too young. The anxiety would be too great. So we started using art as the platform for that. So we talked to children about their human rights and got them to portray that. And it became like a sense of gold because the children were very thoughtful about which human right they wanted to portray in their work. They were also thoughtful about the stories that they told to accompany their work. And there we had very powerful representations which could stand up and be seen by adults and children alike and interpreted by all. And so this became the beginning of my practice of um, adults working with children to convey ideas. Now, Gay, you have been working on this as well in more contemporary times. So you are working with early childhood teachers in arts education. And I'd really like you to talk a little bit about your practice now and how teachers see themselves as um, really giving birth to children's ideas and protecting their ideas and portraying their ideas publicly. Thanks, Barbara. Yes, and thanks for inviting me as well. I feel really honoured to be in, in your company and, and with Kate and, and everyone and Sandra as well. Um, I'm sitting on Ewan Country, which is on the beautiful New South Wales South Coast, and I too would like to pay my respects to the local, to traditional custodians of the land, the elders past, present, and emerging, those beautiful children that we're all working uh, to, to support them to be heard. And I guess that's where my research and all of my practice springboards from, in that after 20 years as an early childhood teacher, I too often felt that children's voices weren't being listened to. And I saw that real disconnect between early childhood teachers and, and educators saying that children's voices were valid and that children could be artists and that children's meaning making mattered to them. And yet in the same sentence, announcing that they were not themselves artistic um, and handing children colouring in sheets for mm -hmm. stencil type activities to complete. And so I saw this real disconnect between what people were saying mattered in their practice, but what was happening um, in actuality. And so that's what really sprung brought me into doing postgraduate research, you know, leaving my teaching and directing career and moving into academia because I wanted to find out, well, what's going on? And intuitively, I knew that the educators' personal beliefs about themselves as artists had a huge impact on the decisions that were made in the classroom. And I asked myself, well, you know, what happens to a child's desire to communicate their own meaning and to express their ideas and theories? And this happens, you know, when you're one, two, three, four and five years old. And listening to you, Kate, I was reflecting on the fact that Greta um, wouldn't have developed the voice, as Barbara said, without that network, without the people who listened to her and said her voice was valid from a very young age. And so in terms of personal beliefs and, and what we call self-efficacy, the belief that you can translate the knowledge you have in a particular learning domain into a curriculum that actually is meaningful, meaningful for children, um, that significantly determines what's offered to children. It determines how they're supported in their learning. It determines the materials they're offered. It determines the choices the teachers and the educators make in terms of scaffolding and supporting and equipping children to speak the language of art. You know, Dr. Barbara, uh, Dr. Um, Felicity McArdle asked us to um, question, you know, what if, what if we were to teach art in the same way we teach language? What if we were to give children the means by which to truly express their ideas rather than uh, give the answers that people think children are capable of or the express art that that adults sort of determine they're going to be able to which really talks down to children and doesn't consider them as capable and competent which is the language we use in early childhood teaching you know if we do believe children are capable to communicate to explore their ideas and to play in and through the arts then it's really necessary that the adults who are working with them believe in that capability um, Carlina Rinaldi from Reggio Emilia, I think it was, who said, you know, every capable child needs a capable teacher. 
and too often the studies show us that generalist teachers, you know, don't know enough. Uh, they don't have enough pedagogical content knowledge about the domain that they're supporting children in. So that generalist idea of, you know, not really feeling like you're an expert in anything. And then combined with that, the lack of personal belief about people's own art making capacity. And I know if I was to walk down the street uh, in any town and I ask my students when they come to uni to put their hands up if they consider themselves to have some artistic skill or capacity and probably you know only maybe three out of a classroom of 40 students will have the confidence to say that that is still a language for them and I really despair at that because that's our humanity lost you know how do we lose that natural capacity to communicate using the hundred languages and why does it get narrowed down to the point where even our teachers are saying that they are, you know, only competent in a couple of domains and that they can't really think in rich and sort of holistic ways. And so I think if we're really going to honour children's voices, we have to design learning experiences that lead them to educational growth rather than educational stagnation. And we need to move as the beautiful Sir Ken Robinson said, we have to move beyond you know, the industrial revolution model of education and into a more holistic arts aesthetic uh, education that really supports children to be fully human. So um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. And I want yeah. to, I, uh, because there's so many things to follow up here. It's a very rich conversation, but it's just a first conversation. As I said at the beginning, we haven't had this conversation before. So hold your thoughts. Um, to the audience, please, you have about five more minutes before we go to Q&A. So please go to the Facebook page or to the SLQ live stream chat and put your questions in. I'm going to move to question three now. So question three is, can children change the world? It's the topic of the conversation. and. There are times when I think, well, nothing really has changed much, but I take heart because, Sandra, your example in the beginning shows that in 40 years, in two generations, you can make change. So I'd like to explore this notion just very quickly with each person here so that we can then turn to Q&A. Can children change the world? Well, um, I hope so <laughs> because the adults aren't doing it a great job of things. Uh, so that's my, my first response. And um, I, I liked your earlier question around how do we, you know, how do we, um, it, something, it made me think about trusting children mm -hmm. and understanding that children are reliable narrators. They are reliable witnesses. Um, they are observant, as you said, Kate. I have a, a three-year-old granddaughter. Uh, I can attest to her um, powers of observation are incredibly acute mm -hmm. and astute. And the job that I have is to take the time to listen to her, to nurture and nourish her confidence about what it is that she sees and how she expresses, how she chooses to express it to me. Um, so, short answer, can children change the world? I hope so. Great. Kate, can they? Um, you know, I'm going to pick up on something that Sandra said quite early um, in the piece about respecting, uh, uh, respecting children's ability to, to hold and share knowledge, right? And I think this is, this is pretty much it. The minute we're able to genuinely do that, um, I think we're going to be on the right track. I mean, no matter what our social role is, um, our job is to elevate, include, and make visible children's voices and ideas. And I think that we get to look for opportunities in our everyday lives. So whatever it is we do, whatever your job, whatever your role, um, if, if you get to meet children, you'll get an opportunity to do that elevation. Um, in my job, it's you know thinking about children as writers and critics, so I have an opportunity there. But I think everybody has that opportunity, mm -hmm. no matter what their job. What do you think, Gay? I think it's really important in this conversation to also think about the children who are under five. Um, too many, too often, I think children, ch that group, age group of children absolutely are the future. They can change the world. 
but it comes with a caveat that we need to stop thinking of them as citizens of the future and position them as citizens now um, with every single right um, that they deserve. And so, as you said earlier, Barbara, you know, children are powerful and capable, but they do require that co-learner, that co-researcher, that co-teacher adult to partner with them and actually support their voice to be heard because otherwise society tends to still want children to sit in a corner and behave and be quiet. So yes, they can if people listen to them. So I, I just want to give a quick uh, response to, I, um, I was collecting some children's drawings in 2013 around their human rights and I was working in this school with a large number of recent arrival children who had come from the Central African Republic and from the um, war-torn countries. And uh, one of the girls drew this, what I consider the most horrifying drawing in my collection. It's a drawing of a girl child who's chained to a post and a large man in a uniform is standing above her and he's whipping her behind him, there's a barbed wire fence and there are other girl children behind that barbed wire. And out of the child's mouth it comes a phrase, please don't take me away from my family. When I saw this drawing, I was shocked um, um, at the revelation that the girl had made. And I um, digitized the image and then took it back to the school and was talking to the children about their works. And I asked who made this picture and the whole class burst into laughter. And I said, this is not a funny picture. What are you laughing at? And the children said, oh, miss, sometimes it's so horrible that you have to laugh because it breaks the tension. And then the young girl whose picture it was stood up and said that she had been in the Central African Republic and her sister was stolen exploited and taken away and put into slavery. And when they got her back, they moved to Australia. And I said to her, oh, this is an amazingly powerful story. And she said to me, but will it make a difference? And I think that I hold that very strongly in my heart. Will children's voices really make a difference? And I, I don't know but I believe that if we pay attention to them, as we have all said, that we can help them to become the social agents for the change that they want to see, and we need to support that. So I'm now going to turn to Q&A, and we've got um, some questions here. Thank you all for wonderful conversation. I don't know where we're going to go with this. So Julie says, while lots of work has been done in raising awareness of the importance of children's views, how do we amplify these with policymakers? Who wants to take this on? Kate? I think that children need to be included um, a lot more than they are. I think there's a lot of, you know, tokenistic efforts to include um, children on decision-making um, panels and committees that affect them but you know we need to look at whether or not this is actually you know are people listening is this going to have an impact um, and I think that if there's genuine people who want to listen they will allow children to drive these processes it's like um, I guess the equivalent would be you know academics spending a lot of time talking about children without talking to them right, <laughs> right. Uh, exactly what we don't exactly what we don't want to see right exactly mm -hmm. what we don't want to do um, and to sort of push to push hard um, above and below to see that those things happen because I think that there's some really great champions of children out there who, who listen and and want to in include children's perspectives and in and, and genuine consultancy. Um, but mm -hmm. there's a heck of a lot that, you know, the, the reason why they don't is because they don't want to do the things, right, that, would, that they would have to do. Yeah. Any other observations? Gay? It's also about repositioning um, why we have educational institutions, and that's a huge question, right? We've been mm. we've been teaching children in funnels since the industrial revolution. Instead of saying, "Well, what's the purpose of education and learning?" It should be a joyful, all-encompassing 
experience that celebrates who every single child is in, in a room mm. instead of putting children on the conveyor belt um, to do standardised testing and measure all the things that actually don't make living um, meaningful for children and, and their communities. So I think we could have that conversation about why we have education and what is the purpose of early childhood education. Mm. It's not just about being a workforce productivity um, agency. It should actually be about children's rights to experience their cultural life. And I think until people have that conversation, then we're on the same treadmill we've always been yeah. on um, with decision makers making decisions about children, as you say, Kate, without actually asking them what they want and, and what they believe is important in their lives. Barbara, I might add to that. There are great mm. um, responses to that question. Um, the intergenerationality is really important from my perspective here, that children um, should be considered equal to um, grandparents, to parents, to aunties, to uncles, to cousins. So within the context of a whole, mm -hmm. within the context of a collectivity. Um, so I'd say that like policy making um, finds itself in trouble when it doesn't treat the whole person mm -hmm as a whole person. I think we also find ourselves in trouble when we don't understand the whole person within holistic and collective environments, yep. which includes multiple generations. And that's why parents and teachers know children the best, because they are living holistically, whereas policymakers are quite divorced from the actual lived experience of individual families and individual schools and classrooms. I'm going to turn to another question. Rather than unfinished beings, children are expert researchers, negotiators, testers, and observers of the world. Can you describe a time when a child has surprised you with their approach to a problem they faced? I have an example. <laughs> okay. When I have, I've raised three sons as a sole parent. This year they're 28, 27, and 21. <laughs> And as I've mentioned, I've got a three-year-old granddaughter through one of them. Um, when my youngest son was eight, he was in year three in a um, Queensland state school. They had a um, replacement teacher for the day, a supply teacher. There was um, two children. My son's not very dark-skinned, but there were two children in the room who were very dark-skinned. One was brand new. The supply teacher was aware of that. Um, one had been in school from um, kindergarten, um, from preschool with my son, um, a boy and a girl. So the supply teacher says the boy's um, from Fiji, Indian Fijian, and the girl was from Sri Lanka, newly arrived. Completely different cultural backgrounds, completely different origin stories, completely different full stop. The supply teacher says, oh, she understands that this um, girl has recently arrived. Well, isn't that wonderful? And she turns to James because now you've got a friend. So in a classroom of largely um, clearly Anglo students with my son who's not very dark skinned, there's two dark skinned um, children and the teacher makes all these assumptions. Anyway, my son comes home and uh, tells me the story and he goes, Oh, and I'm thinking, he's saying to, him, to me, I'm thinking to myself, they're not even from the same country, you know. So the eight-year-old knew so much more than that, that teacher, that adult at that point. Great. <laughs> um, we have about five more minutes, so I'm just going to take up this question from Ben. Four-year-old four year olds are citizens, not potential citizens. What makes a good citizen? And do you think Australian adults are doing enough to teach this? Whoa, thank you. Well, I, I might start. <laughs> yeah, I might start by saying I think that uh, the democratization of schooling needs to be regenerated. Uh, we have seen, I think, in the past 40 years, a slipping, a backward trend where children's ideas are not the platform for curriculum thinking and decision making and their efficacy 
is not driving what they want to learn. So I think we're in trouble here. And I, I believe when I trained as a teacher in the 70s, certainly the democratization of learning and children's self-efficacy and their um, driving the curriculum with their ideas was very dominant. But because of the testing regimes that have come in in recent times, we've seen that not only diminish, but really virtually disappear. Any other comments? Yeah, I have a comment. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, mine is just in addition to yours, um, Barbara, that I feel like, you know, the, the buzzword is collaboration, you know, the idea that um, teachers and students will work uh, together to make learning experiences that are meaningful for children. But I do feel very, you know, sorry is not the best word empathy for teachers who i feel like aren't well resourced to be able to do that for the reasons that you outlined um under lots of pressure to kind of you know complete tick boxes curriculum whatever um as opposed to being able to do those things that would be genuinely collaborative with students and i think that you know if we can find a way to better empower teachers um, towards that goal that would be a really important um, thing that we could do yeah, I'd agree. We have to equip teachers and empower them um, to do what they know how to do well, mm -hmm. um, but also to help them to find the child that's been lost within themselves, because I think our society squeezes that out um, in the ways we educate students all the way through, um, including early childhood. You know, the corruption of creativity begins when children are given bunny bum templates to complete instead mm -hmm. of a piece of charcoal to draw their own ideas and responses to the world. You know, that's where it should begin. And yeah, I don't know how we shift that policy, but thanks to Ben for a really important point about children's citizenship. Can I add, Barbara, mm. that um, we have to role model good citizenship as well at every level of society. And we have to, you know, we have to take serious our responsibility to ensure that leadership yeah. political corporate and otherwise community um that you know they are pe people who know how to behave well yeah. um so it doesn't start in the classroom even though the classroom is an important element of it so i'd like to thank you all very much for participating tonight in this conversation we have um Oh, we have two minutes to go and one more question. From Kay, how do we include the wounded children? How do we bring in the bullies and the bullied, the abused and the shamed? Whoa. Um, do Kay, we ask them the same questions? Yeah. yeah. Let, give them your voice. Go, Kay. <laughs> oh, I would just agree with you. I think that, you know, I the teachers are wonderful, you know, all the teachers that I interact with, and they're desperately trying to look to that strengths-based model where they're able to find um, what is beyond that, what is beyond um, the, the bullying or the trauma or, um, you know, whatever other kind of uh, disenfranchised kind of um, experiences that they've had um, and find that strength that they're able to kind of celebrate and, um, and work with in the classroom and, and, and help them become uh, a leader or a, someone to inspire other kids and collaborate and all those good things. Yeah, and I'd add to that to say that, you know, every, every behaviour or is a, communica is a desire to communicate. And so if we can re-embrace the multiple languages that children inherently know how to speak so you know why aren't we supporting them to dance their theories and and paint their theories and draw their theories to communicate who they are and maybe then they're not so disenfranchised from the way our society functions you know if again if we give them that voice through the arts as ken robinson kept on saying throughout his wonderful career so i'm going to close now by First of all, thanking all of you and State Library of Queensland and our wonderful signing interpreters. Thank you all so much for supporting us. I do think um, that children can change the world, but the world needs changing. And so we have to support them in this process of making change. Um, I think we need to find very strong ways to influence power brokers 
in the policy level at government, that's local, state, and national, and international, to pay more attention to children's voices. And if we become the support system for that, and honestly and authentically represent their ideas, I think we can make the change that children are talking about. We can make, help them become more visible, support their agency, and support their voice. But we have a great challenge to make people pay attention. We have a great challenge to get the investments that we need, and we have a great challenge to expand public discourse. So I thank the conversation and State Library of Queensland for starting this dialogue. Thank you all.